a, a really hairy uh, diving story um, that I have that I is stupid actually for me. Uh, we were we were working. Uh, this was in the 70s, and uh, we were working on sea otters. Uh, sea otters had just come back to uh, and established themselves, and they were just moving their way up to in the Santa Cruz coast. Um, and uh, we were trying to establish what do they really do um, to the uh, to sea urchins, and uh, we wanted to get a place where and, and abalones. We wanted to find a place that abalones had not been. Uh, uh, collected very much because when we started working in Santa Cruz and uh, right off the point of Santa Cruz there was a uh, at Lighthouse Point there was a, at that time the kelp forest was very narrow it was right along the coast and then on the outside was uh, covered with uh, urchins uh, and so we, we anticipated the, the uh, otters coming up there and taking out the urchins and so we did a transect there but we're talking to people and they said oh you should have been here 10 years ago there were abalones all over there that was a mainly abalones there and people were collecting them and they collected them all out that's why you don't see abalones anymore uh, and uh, so we wanted to find a place where there were abalones and they were at Año Nuevo um, and so I got uh, two of my graduate students, three of us, and we went up to Año Nuevo, all ready to go diving. Uh, and by that time, there was also uh, quite a few elephant seals there, harbor seals, uh, and stellar sea lions um, were all on the island. And there was, it was also it was known that there was a lot of sharks there. Um, but what you know, we were we were just going to diving. You know? We don't have to worry about sharks. Uh, and so we went in, uh, and we were, as we went in, uh, there, it, we went into some channels that are, it was, a, it was really interesting diving. The, the, uh, very surgy, the visibility was maybe uh, three feet at the most, two or three feet. So you couldn't see very much, and we kind of went down and almost held hands as we went down. Um, we ran into a seal without a head. Um, that made us a little bit nervous. and. Uh, but then we were able to uh, actually go down, and we went down repeatedly. Um, we found that the bottom was just coated with abalones um, everywhere. Um, and the urchins were all along the sides. Um, it was just, it was really quite spectacular. And uh, so we collected a bunch of abalones, we measured them, we put them all back. Um, and uh, by the third dive, uh, one of my students, uh, Val Gerard, who was a very strong-minded woman. I'm through with this place! <laughs> I'm never going to go back here! And so she was really out with that. But it was, a, it was one of the scariest places. Uh, when we started to think about it, it was uh, just nuts to do that. Um, but I didn't learn, and I had a, another student um, who really wanted to go and see this system. So I took her out, and the two of us went out. Um, and. Uh, we went down one of the channels and got down about uh, 20 feet and it was a lot of uh, kelp slopping back and forth uh, and as you're kind of going through that kelp, put your hand down and it was a dead sea lion, uh, furry and also it didn't have a head. And we were out quite a ways by that time and we were staying really close to the bottom. I didn't want to get up on it. But, uh, that. That set us off, and uh, uh, we didn't realize uh, how much it set us off until we got quite a ways out and we're breathing pretty heavily, and suddenly we were out of air. Um, uh, we had no choice uh, but to come to the surface. <laughs> it was that was really a spooky thing. You hit the surface, the island was way out. You know, we didn't realize how far out we were, and uh, we had to swim back on the surface uh, where the sharks would. Uh, so we came in and there was a, we could either go all the way around the island to, to a beach where we can get out or there was some rocks right there with stellar uh, sea, uh, sea lions on them and, uh, and the surge was pretty high. So we came up uh, to the edge of that rock and uh, waited for the surge uh, and it was going back and forth, back and forth and she was right behind me and I said, I'll go first and you can come right behind me. And, when it came up high, I just jumped and got on the rock. I didn't think, you know, as soon as I hit that rock, all those uh, stellar 
sea lions were off that rock, diving di down <gasps> on top of her. <laughs> I just, <laughs> that was, uh, anyway, she finally got out, we got out, and this, uh, uh, but it was a memorable dive, which uh, we never did again. Um, uh, I, I, I would like to. Uh, we used those data for a paper we did. It was at one place where we had lots of big abalones that we could compare with Hopkins, where the abalones were all small and the cracks and crevices. Um, and I've often thought we should go back and see what it's like now, um, but um, I don't think it's responsible. I think, I, you know, that was when I was uh, still young and stupid. And, uh, not that I've gotten that much smarter, but uh, um, I was really shouldn't have taken students out like that. But uh, the other story that I really wanted to talk about a bit was uh, uh, as a scientist, and maybe people appreciate um, that is, uh, uh, I had a, a lab at Santa Cruz uh, where I did a lot of experiments and we had running seawater and uh, we started to get uh, uh, a brown scuzz uh, growing on the, on the glass and uh, I, I scraped some of it off and looked at it under a microscope and I realized it was a sponge. Um, it was a sponge that had no spicules. Most sponges have lots of uh, either calcareous or glass sponges, uh, spicules that hold them up. This is one that has n no spicules at all. It doesn't even have the um, fibers that make up a spongy sponge. It's just tissue. It's, a, it's, a, it's called a slime sponge. Um, and it's just a slime that's on the rocks. I'd never seen anything like it, and uh, I thought that I knew that there was supposed to be a sponge here that didn't have um, a skeleton, and I'd never seen it. I thought it must be that, and I was looking at it and spending a little bit. It was fascinating. I could look with the microscope right through it and see the feeding chambers inside, and uh, the embryos were that had. So I thought this would be a fantastic animal to look at and keep in culture. I never. Nobody's been able to culture it. It grows on the, la on the sides of things. But the, we had a graduate student who was a really good with sponges, and she was from Venezuela. Uh, and she came into the lab, and I said, Christina, what do you think this is? She said, oh, I don't know. I'll take it back. I can't tell. I'll have to look at it with a scanning electron microscope. And she came back, and she said, John, that's uh, Oscarella. It's a genus which is only known in the Mediterranean and in Europe. It's, it's, it's not found here. I said, oh. Uh, how did it get here? We wouldn't want, I mean, it's a slime, right? And so then I, uh, I was at the aquarium, I went over to the aquarium and I uh, saw it there in the aquarium. I don't know, maybe the aquarium brought it here for some kind of thing from, they have animals from the, Medi from the Mediterranean and it got out or got somehow into my lab. I couldn't figure out how it could get into my lab. Um, and I talked to the people at the quarry, and they said, oh yeah, it's terrible. It grows up sometimes in the spring, and we have to scrape it off. Right? You know, what is that thing? Um, and uh, so I, I was, you know, worried a little bit about it. And after I retired, I used to take my students to uh, Carmel Point, uh, well, all along here. Um, uh, but at Carmel Point was uh, one of my favorite places. And, and at Carmel Point, there's a little uh, red flatworm, which was described there. It's endemic to the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, and it used to be everywhere. And you take, you go out and you'd, there's a green uh, sea lettuce, alga that's there, and these little red spots would be on it. And it's another one of those things that I, you know, you remember from the past and it's not here now. And I, after, I used to take my students out and I'd try to stop and say, hey, look at these little flatworms. These are the simplest flatworms, the simplest animals, and I'd go on about it, and they'd look at me like, you know, what's he talking about? But uh, to me, they're really fascinating because they are really interesting um, uh, bilateral animals, uh, with, uh, and they don't have a gut. They just have a kind of a sensation, and they, they're predatory. They jump on little crustaceans and uh, enclose them. It sounds like a terrible way to go, just, and you can see the thing inside kind of trying to get out and it's engulfed with the, in the thing. But uh, <coughs> they'd, they'd almost disappeared. And so I, I, after I retired, I went, I said, I'm going to have time to really look for them, see what happened to them, because 
they were so abundant here, and uh, I, they are. They don't. They've all all but disappeared. I, I can hardly find them. But uh, but as I was looking, I found this sponge, and that's when I thought, Oh my God, the damn thing's out! It's, it's going to take over the coast. We need to find out what this is. And uh, I wrote to Christina, who had gone back to Venezuela by then, and. Uh, said, can you help me? We need to find out what this is. Uh, and she said, there's one person in the world who has knows anything about it. He's Brazilian. And he did his PhD in France. Uh, and uh, so he, um, I contacted him. And he said, yes, if you'll fix them for a transmission electron microscope. He said, that's the only way we can tell them apart. They have no characters. Um, and uh, so I did, and he he found some characters that he said, I've never seen before, that's a different species. Okay. So we described it, it was the first uh, uh, species of that uh, whole group of animals found in the Pacific. And uh, about the same time, there's another species which is found in Vladivostok in, in uh, Siberia. So, um, and, uh, but anyway, so there it was. It turns out this sponge is really fascinating, I think, because it's a, it's a sponge that doesn't have any, any characters like that, but it does have some characters that other sponges don't have that we have um, uh, in the cells. The cells, uh, uh, tissues uh, in most animals have a kind of a basement uh, membrane underneath the, the, the epithelium. Uh, sponges don't, excepting this one does. Um, and uh, so the sperm is more like uh, other animal sperms than most sponges. Um, so it looks like it could be almost the, the sponge that was us uh, 500 million years ago. Um, I, I, it turns out it's probably not. Um, since we described it, um, it was an interesting other thing, there was a, a, a student at Berkeley who was very interested in sponges and I met him at a conference and he gave a, uh, he organized a symposium on sponges and so I went up to him I said, uh, Scott, his name is Scott Nichols, I, have, have you, uh, have you looked at Oscarella? He says, no, no, I can't get any, come, you know, those French, they have all their Oscarella and they won't send me any, they are so secretive and everything. I said, well, come on to my lab. And, so he came down to the lab. I did a, some nice studies we published on them about their characteristics because he looked at them as somewhat of a transition between sponge-like organization and the rest of us. Um, and uh, did molecular stuff on them. Found out that they are certainly a different species. In fact, there's two species uh, now on molecular basis. And, uh, he hasn't named the second one yet. but. Uh, uh, and and uh, they now have their genome. So if you look at, if you're in biology and you have, you know, these uh, relationships with with genomes, um, uh, with different groups, the sponge is this species, which is only described in 2004. So that's uh, how. So that to me was really exciting. And, uh,